M S W Media. Hello and welcome to the Daily Beans for Friday, September 16th, 2022. Today, Mark Meadows was subpoenaed by the Department of Justice and complied. President Biden averts a rail strike that would have upended the economy. Letitia James, New York Attorney General, says she may sue Donald Trump and at least one of his adult children after rejecting his settlement offer. Gavin Newsom has asked Merrick Garland to investigate Abbott and DeSantis for busing and flying immigrants to Martha's Vineyard and the Naval Yard. Jeffrey Clark told the D.C. Bar that the Department of Justice was investigating him for conspiracy, obstruction and making false statements. And the January 6th committee subpoena yields thousands of Secret Service records. I'm Allison Gill. And I'm Dana Goldberg. Whew, lots of news today, Dana. And good news. There, there's good stuff happening. Yes, lots of good stuff. Crises averted. And speaking of good news, we're going to cover the good news later in the show. You can send your good news to us at dailybeanspod.com. Just click on contact. And I'll be talking to Greg Oliar of the Prevail podcast. And if you ordered a Crimes and Crimes and Crimes shirt, we are working on sending you out the right size. In the meantime, please send us a photo of your dog or child wearing the shirt, wearing the small (laughs) shirt that you received on accident. (laughs) And also let us know if we can share that on social media, too. I know a lot of people don't like photos of their children shared, so I'd like to get permission ahead of that. And a couple little news items. The chair of the House Select Committee investigating the January 6th Capitol attack said the panel has received thousands of exhibits the Secret Service agents, in response to its July subpoena of the agency. And the Department of Justice is still waiting on a response from Judge Eileen Cannon on their motion to stay part of her ruling. DOJ has said if she doesn't stay that part of her ruling or denies, you know, the stay or doesn't respond by midnight tonight, they'll appeal to the 11th Circuit. And already those lawyers are starting to pop up on the 11th Circuit docket. And our governor, Gavin Newsom, has written a letter to Merrick Garland asking him to investigate Abbott and DeSantis for what I believe is human trafficking, busing and flying immigrants to sanctuary cities, quote unquote. Criminal Resource Manual, Title 8, Subsection 1324A1A2, domestic transport makes it an offense for any person who, knowing that an alien has entered the United States, transports or moves or attempts to transport or move such alien within the United States. So there's a crime resource manual thing about it. I love it. I hope they get busted for this. Yeah. And if the DOJ, if the pattern of investigatory things goes the way that it usually goes, probably next week, we might actually see a lawsuit filed or something by the Department of Justice. We'll see. It depends on if they can determine whether laws were broken here or not. And Dana, you have some some cool news to announce. I do. I don't normally do this. Normally my gigs these days have been galas, black tie galas in different cities, but I am doing a show for Utah Pride Live. And so if you're in Utah, November 5th, we are actually doing a big theater show with a few mutant musical acts. I'll be emceeing. I'll be doing a comedy set. It's going to help support Utah Pride Center. So if you are in Utah or just want to travel to Utah for this show, it's going to be a blast. It's a Saturday night, November 5th. You can get tickets at utahpridecenter.org. And I'm giving away three sets. So I'm going to give away three sets of tickets, six different tickets. And I already know I would like to give away two tickets. And I'm going to need the person who submits these stories to write into us. But the family whose daughter moved there with her girlfriend to Salt Lake City and just got her white coat. Please email us at The Daily Beans because I really want your daughter and her girlfriend to come to this show, be my guests, and we'll figure out how to give away the other two sets. But that's really important to me. So if you're listening and I apologize, I don't know who the submitter is. I know you are listening because you listen all the time. Send us a message. Give me your email. I will get in contact with you. Cool. And yeah, maybe one of our producers, too, can go back through the good news and see if we can find that person's email address if they gave it to us when they submitted. But the easiest way would be to also reach out to us and and we'll get those tickets. That's yeah. so awesome. And is the show in Salt Lake City? The show's in Salt Lake City and uh, it's going to be in the ballroom at a hotel. It's it's going to be a great show. So I'm excited because I haven't been to Salt Lake to actually do stand up in a very long time. I just did a virtual show for Salt Lake and um, now I actually get to be in person. It's going to be a good time. 
it's it's a, a very cool city. I absolutely love SLC and uh, I'm excited. I'm so excited for this show for you. When is it again? November? November 5th, Saturday, November 5th. Cool. Awesome. Thank you for that. All right. We have a lot of news to get to. So let's hit the hot notes. Hot notes. And this just in. Breaking. This has just been handed to me. Judge Cannon has denied the Department of Justice's motion for a partial stay and has appointed Raymond Deary as the special master. So that means that the Department of Justice will file its appeal with the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals and will find out if they're just going to appeal the same thing they appealed in their narrow motion for a stay with Judge Eileen Cannon, if they're going to appeal her entire giant bullshit ruling. (laughs) We'll see. We'll see (laughs) if it's a broader appeal or not. We'll get to that as soon as it comes out. Also in the news today, former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows has complied with a subpoena from the Justice Department's investigation into events surrounding January 6th, according to sources familiar with the matter. That makes him the highest ranking Trump official known to have responded to a subpoena in a federal investigation. Meadows turned over the same materials he provided to the House Select Committee investigating the U.S. Capitol attack meeting the obligations of the Justice Department subpoena, according to one source, and that has not been previously reported. Last year, Meadows turned over thousands of text messages and emails to the House committee, as we know. In addition to Trump's former chief of staff, one of Meadows' top deputies in the White House, Ben Williamson, friend of Cassidy Hutchinson, also recently received a grand jury subpoena. That's according to another source familiar with the matter. That subpoena was similar to what others in Trump's orbit received. It asked for testimony and records relating to January 6th and efforts to overturn the election. Williamson previously cooperated with the January 6th committee. He declined to comment to CNN. Meadows' compliance with the subpoena comes as the Justice Department has ramped up its investigation related to January 6th, with now touches nearly every aspect of the defeated former guy's efforts to overturn his 2020 loss, including the fraudulent electors plot, efforts to push baseless election fraud claims, and how money flowed to support these various efforts. An attorney for Meadows declined to comment. After Meadows stopped cooperating with the House committee, Congress referred him to the DOJ for contempt, and the DOJ declined to prosecute him for contempt. It's not yet clear according to uh, CNN, whether the Justice Department will seek more materials from Meadows as part of the ongoing criminal investigation. I think they will. The, the DOJ doesn't just get stuff and then stop. Yeah. They, <laughs> they, they take what they get and get more stuff. Following last month's FBI search of Mar-a-Lago, Meadows handed over texts and emails to the National Archives that had not been previously turned over from his time in the administration. And then Trump has been counseled to, you remember, we talked about this, to cut contact with Meadows. And some of Trump's attorneys believe Meadows could also be investigators in their crosshairs and are concerned he could become a fact witness if he's pushed to cooperate. Still, Trump and Meadows have spoken a number of times, according to the source familiar with the relationship. And I predicted this two months ago, Dana, in a Twitter thread. So this is probably it's probably doesn't sound like breaking news to people who listen to the beans. But for the rest of the country, it is. Here was my my little thread. I said recently the DOJ told the court that it wasn't an OLC memo that stopped them from indicting Meadows for contempt. That leaves prosecutorial discretion and allows them to indict him for other stuff, including contempt. And that's a big deal, I said, because a lot of folks were saying that the DOJ let Meadows walk over an OLC memo. We know that's not the case. And absolutely, immunity doesn't exist for former presidents or their top advisors. So why did they decline to indict Meadows for contempt, I asked. I said, let's recall what happened with Pete Navarro. DOJ subpoenaed him for his communications with Trump. He came in and they offered him a deal, which he rejected. So they indicted him the next day for contempt. And I said back in July, I imagine the same kind of thing happened with Meadows. Maybe they subpoenaed him for other stuff. Perhaps he came in and because he's not an idiot with garbage lawyers, maybe he decided to enter into some kind of discussion with DOJ. So they did not indict him. The reason I tend to believe that scenario is because it is preposterous to believe they didn't indict him for contempt and they're not investigating him for anything else. Additional clues, Cheney didn't list him as one of the patsies at the beginning of the last committee hearing. And further, Trump's legal team is prepping to make Meadows the fall guy. Also, Carol Lennig told Deadline White House to basically watch this space, saying she believed there would be more information from the DOJ based on her informed understanding of the matter. All that coupled with this latest DOJ filing tells me some heavy shit is coming down the pike regarding Mark Meadows. Disclaimer, this is speculation fueled by available facts and (laughs) beans come true. So people who tell me to, you know, 
Twitter speculators to fuck off, I, I say fuck off back. So Meadows and Navarro were subpoenaed by DOJ. Meadows complied. Navarro did not. Navarro was indicted. Meadows was not, which leaves me wondering whether Scavino, who was not indicted for contempt, was also subpoenaed and whether he complied. Also, I just want to say, if it's true Meadows was only subpoenaed for what he already gave the committee, then this would be just the beginning of the probe into him or his cooperation. I speculate that it could lead to additional inquiries and subpoenas. Thank you so much, AG. And in other Donald Trump, you can go fuck yourself news. We've got the New York Attorney General's office has rebuffed an offer from Donald J. Trump's lawyers to settle a contentious civil investigation into the former president and his family's real estate business. This is setting a stage for a lawsuit that would accuse Donald of fraud. And that's according to three people with the knowledge of this matter. So we got the AG, Letitia James, whoop, whoop, is also considering suing at least one of Donald's adult children, one of his crotch fruit. And this is what the people have said. Ivanka, Eric, and Donald Jr. have all been senior executives at Mr. Trump's company, the Trump Organization. AG, if he really wants to get Donald in the soft spot, he should go after <laughs> Ivanka. Yeah, well, I think, <laughs> you know, he could be Eric because Eric had several phone calls with people putting together their, you know, their disposition on how rich they were. Absolutely. And he was lying to people on the phone. But also it could be Ivanka because she was a paid consultant for the company while working for the company, which is a fraud in the state of New York. So it could be. It could be any of them. Yeah. So any and all. All right. Now, the likelihood of a lawsuit, it grew this month after Ms. James' office rejected at least one settlement offer from Mr. Trump's lawyers. This is what the people close said. While the Trump organization for months has made overtures to the attorney general's office and the two sides could still reach a deal, there's no indication that a settlement will materialize anytime soon. I seriously fucking doubt if they have the case that they do, the Letitia James is going to take a fucking dime from this family. No, right? And like, She's awful. It's a witch hunt. She's go. It's just political. It's bullshit witch hunt. Can I? Can you can please I write you a with check? Me? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. And in other awesome prosecutor news, the prosecutor investigating efforts by Donald and his allies to challenge the 2020 election results in Georgia said this week that her team, I love these women so much, that her team have heard credible allegations that serious crimes have been committed and that she believes some individuals may see jail time. What? And this is a quote. The allegations are very serious. If indicted and convicted, people are facing prison sentences. That is from Fonnie Willis. That's what she told the Washington Post. No decision will be made for months or whether there will be indictments. And most notably, if Trump himself will ever face charges, but at least 17 people have been notified they are targets of the criminal investigation, meaning they could eventually face charges, A.G., and more targets are going to be added to this list very soon, Willis said in an interview Tuesday in her Atlanta office. Shit is getting real down in Georgia. Mm-hmm. You know who's left? Brian Kemp. Oh, uh, but I think, no, he, he didn't get a target letter. He's just a witness. But they still also, you know, need to talk to Lindsey Graham and uh, good old Don. If Lindsey could just get off the fainting couch, maybe we could have a word with him. <laughs> yeah. And Donnie, small hands, can answer his phone with his small hands. We'll see. The Justice Department is investigating felony violations of false statements, conspiracy and obstruction as part of its one six probe that led to a recent search of Jeffrey Clark's home in his chonies, according to an account of the criminal investigation made public Wednesday in a separate proceeding. This is fucking hilarious. Clark's legal team, Clark's lawyers, wrote that on June 20th, approximately a dozen armed agents of the DOJ Office of Inspector General executed a criminal search warrant at Mr. Clark's home at 7 a.m. and seized his electronic devices as part of an investigation into violations of laws concerning false statements, conspiracy and obstruction. This is according to a report published Wednesday by a committee of the D.C. Bar Association's Board of Professional Responsibility. Whoops. So in, in his Bar Association investigation into shittiness, that's how we learned that the DOJ was investigating him for these three things. These are the same crimes Judge Carter said Eastman and Trump more likely than not committed. 18 U.S. 371 conspiracy, 1512C2 is the obstruction. But Clark is also being investigated for lying to investigators, which is 18 U.S. Code 1001. This is the first time a document has named the specifics of what the Justice Department is considering as possible crimes as it looks as the top circles at the top circle of political players around FAPOTUS. Separate from the criminal investigation in which Clark has not been charged yet, 
The D.C. Bar's Disciplinary Council brought an ethics complaint against Clark for the role he played in seeking to use his department to promote Trump's bogus election fraud claims in 2020. The Attorney Discipline Committee's report released Wednesday quoted an assertion Clark made in a still confidential filing where he discloses the details of the search of his home. He argued to the ethics authorities that his proceedings there should be on hold while the Department of Justice and other authorities investigate him. It's like one investigation at a time, you guys. Come on. (laughs) All right. And to close out this segment, the White House, this is a big deal. The White House early Thursday morning announced an agreement between rail carriers and union leaders. What that did is it's likely averting a national rail strike that threatened to paralyze key parts of the U.S. economy. And this was a lot. With less than 24 hours to avoid a potential shutdown, President Biden said that negotiators had clinched a tentative deal to keep freight trains running and prevent a major disruption to the nation's supply chains. The agreement provides workers with the ability to take days off for sick leave and medical emergencies. I can't believe they couldn't fucking do this already. The union's central demand in the negotiations, that's what they wanted, although it granted them only one day of paid sick leave, according to two people briefed on the plan who spoke on the condition of anonymity because it has not yet been publicly announced. Now, the agreement, which must still be ratified by the unions, it represents a major breakthrough for the White House after it launched an all-out effort to prevent this shutdown that could have had significant economic and political ramifications in the run-up to the midterms. Now, the president was personally involved in these talks, calling into negotiations convened by Labor Secretary Marty Walsh in Washington around 9 p.m. last Wednesday, this past Wednesday, and pressing both the carriers and the unions to come to an agreement in phone calls just this week. Biden had grown very animated in recent days about the lack of scheduling flexibility for workers, expressing a mixture of confusion and anger that management was refusing to budge on that point, according to two people who spoke on the condition of anonymity, to share details of private conversations with the president. Now, before this deal, AG, the Wall Street Journal wrote, and this is a quote, you think some $5 trillion in new spending by this Congress, much of which will fatten unions' bottom lines, would be enough to buy some labor peace. If not, Democrats on Capitol Hill have the power to impose another cooling off period so the two sides can negotiate without a strike. Let's see if Democrats side with their big labor allies or with the U.S. economy that needs the trains to run on time. After the deal, President Biden, quote, tweeted that statement from the Wall Street Journal and said, thanks for your concern, Wall Street Journal. To answer your question, yes, the trains are running on time. I love that whoever's running it, whether it's Biden, whoever else, man, sometimes some shade just comes right on through. <laughs> there is, yeah, Wall Street Journal is like, will they side with big labor allies or with the economy? And he did both and won everything. And, was and like, Biden's like, barrel, middle I know, he's like, you. I'm sorry, I can't hear that tweet over the running of the trains. <laughs> I'm sorry, you couldn't hear that over the sound of the trains. Oh, God, that's so fucking good. All right, I'll be right back with Greg Oliar. And then after that, we have the good news. Everybody stick around. After these messages, we'll be right back. Hey, everyone, I've owned a tailored mattress from Helix Sleep for a very long time now, and I could never go back to anything else. It is a lifesaver. Helix Sleep is a premium mattress brand with a lineup of 14 unique mattresses each designed for specific sleep positions and feel preferences. These include luxury models, a mattress for big and tall sleepers, and a mattress made just for kids. They have models with memory foam layers to provide optimal pressure relief if you sleep on your side, plus enhanced cooling features to keep you from overheating at night. You can find out which Helix mattress works best for you by taking the two-minute Helix sleep quiz. I was matched with the Helix Midnight because I like a, a a medium firm bed and I sleep on my side, as you all know. These mattresses are amazing. They're shipped straight to your door, fast and free of charge. They come with a 10 or a 15-year warranty, depending on the model. They set up fast and easy. They're delivered in a box straight to your door. You get 100 sleeps to try it out risk-free, and if you don't love it, they'll pick it up for you and give you a full refund. Don't want to take my word for it? Helix has been awarded the number one best overall mattress pick by GQ and Wired Magazine, and it's recommended by multiple doctors of sleep medicine as a go-to solution for improving sleep. And right now, Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for listeners. Just go to helixsleep.com slash dailybeans. That's H-E-L-I-X sleep.com slash dailybeans for up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows. With Helix, better sleep starts now. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. I'm honored to be joined today by my friend, good friend, host of the Prevail podcast. Please welcome Greg Oliar. Hi, Greg. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing awesome. And a large part of that has to do with the fact that just this past Friday, you premiered season four 
of Prevail and had one of our favorite guests on, Craig Unger. Tell us a little bit about that. That is true. I think you're probably feeling good also because you, you know, went to the White House and went to a party. But, you know, that's fine. Um, Now, Craig Unger, you know, great journalist, investigative journalist, been on this beat for decades, wrote American Compromise, wrote House of Trump, House of Putin, wrote House of Bush, House of Saud, all this stuff, you know, going back decades in investigative work. So I started writing about what I call Trump Russia about six years ago. And I would get really excited because I'd find something and be like, oh, this is cool. And then I'd realize, oh, Craig Unger wrote about this like 15 years yeah, ago. Yeah, he's the Simpsons of Trump Russia. <laughs> you know, oh, Craig Unger yeah. already did it. Yeah, every time I found some big explosive thing that I'm like, look what I stumbled upon. Yeah, Craig Unger wrote about it already. Yeah. And um, <laughs> it's true. And he's great. And I wanted to have him on to start the season because I was on vacation or at least not making new shows during all the brouhaha after the FBI quote unquote raid. And, you know, which look, it, it's looking like this is a vast, horrible act of espionage that's just, it's almost unthinkable what we're, we're sort of inching to. And there is no reason why Trump would take all those files benignly. There, there just isn't a reason that I or anyone I've asked can think of. So I wanted to have Craig on, especially to talk about that. And he said, you know, I published this book about how Trump is a Russian spy and my jaws on the ground. You know, with how crazy. Right. Yeah. yeah. And and how some of those documents look like from at least some of the clues and some of the markings on them come from Crossfire Hurricane, which is the code name for the Trump Russia investigation that kicked off in, uh, I believe, 2016 in the in the spring when they found out about good old uh, Papadopoulos popping off at the mouth, popping off the top of his esophagus over <laughs> over in a London pub. The most useful idiot of useful idiots. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And there's a fight. There's some FISA stuff. I'm sure that has to do with Carter Page, another one of the great useful idiots of our time. And how about the uh, news this week about the good old Durham probe into the oranges of the Trump Russia investigation, gallivanting all over the world, him and Barr trying to trying to debunk the entire Trump Russia investigation and coming up with pretty much nothing. Yeah, rolled snake eyes on that. Although, I mean, I'm sure it was a lot of fun to go around the world with Bill Barr. Oh, yeah. I would imagine that Mm. having to come up with reasons for this would require a shit ton of alcohol. But I don't know. I, I, I can probably pick two people I would rather go have a drink with, even in even in their little group of horrible MAGA people. These are two particularly unfun people. So yeah, hanging out with Bill Barr has to be like going to an insurance seminar. I mean, it's it, it doesn't seem. Uh, or what? What did George Carlin say? It's like watching flies fuck, right? Yes, like a, he said that about golf. By the yes, way. <laughs> yes, he did. Which was another <laughs> interesting thing that happened this week. <laughs> Eight or ten guys on a golf course with no golf clubs wandering around. Uh, Nothing to see here. Stay yeah. away from Mr. Trump. <laughs> Put the camera away. I'm going to break your fucking arm. Yeah. I don't know. It seemed very, very normal to me. Um, I'm not a big golf guy, but I don't know. You know, I often just go with a bunch of my dude friends with big necks to the middle of an open <laughs> space uh, right before the, the thunderstorm. And uh, that seems like a smart thing to do. Yeah. I just keep seeing like Pesci and, and you know, in casino when they're in the car, turning up the volume, talking with the, you know, the papers over their mouths and playing music real loud. I just that's kind of that's the vibe I get from from all that. If anybody happened to have seen Casino, it's a the walk and talk with the uh, noise obstruction is a common, <laughs> it's a very common thing. Now, although they could have just been, you know, wanting to be on the next Saudi golf tournament schedule and uh, might be revamping that golf course. Who knows? Have you talked a lot about the Live Golf Tour on your show? Because I feel like, you know, it's one of these sports things and people that people that listen to my show and probably people who listen to your show and people who listen to sports is a, a it's there are two Venn diagram pieces that don't often connect. But, the, mm-hmm. you know, that shit is just bad. I mean, they gave the golfers so much money, like unfathomable amounts of money. Phil Mickelson is making more money just from the year he's done this than in his entire career so far, by far. Mm -hmm. So, and it's Greg Norman rolling this out. And apparently they offered Tiger Woods like high nine figures to tour. And Tiger Woods was like, yeah, go fuck yourself, which Mm -hmm. is cool. He may have done it because he doesn't like the golf involved and for golf reasons. And also I think he personally doesn't like Greg Norman. This is all inside baseball, but with golf, but the tour is like, it's really kind of having this ripple effect thing 
you know, and it's politically charged. So you need to have a guy who owns golf courses that doesn't mind that the Saudis are funding this thing to hope. I know a guy who owns golf courses that like Saudis. Mm -hmm. His name is Donald Trump. It's amazing how this world worked out. Well, does he have any um, experience in laundering money, though? I mean, you know, yes, yes, he does. I I think that he does. (laughs) It's also notable that right before this FBI search and seizure on Mar-a-Lago, like a week or two before, there was the big live golf tournament at Bedminster. And, um, you know, Saudi nationals were there. And I'm just saying, if you if you're trying to pack stuff into a golf bag, taking it out of the folder that it's in, you can fit a lot more shit in there. That way. So I'm going to say, <laughs> yeah, 43 empty folders. <clears throat> yeah. We know it too well. So uh, tell us a little bit more about what's coming up on uh, the next the coming episodes of Prevail. I've got some good people on. You know, which is got- which is an MSW media joint, I have to say, for full disclosure. It is. But yeah, this list is incredible. Tell us about some of these upcoming guests, Kimberly K. Hong, Victor Rudd, Amanda Moore, Sandy Lewis. I mean, this is a hell of a lineup you got. Yeah, I've got, it. you know, the thing that I do with my show is just I try to have people on that I think are interesting and that I can learn from. And then I ask them questions and I sh- and I let them talk. So that's kind of if you haven't listened to it, if you're listening, that's that's my bag. Victor, I've had on before. He's the chair of the Ukrainian American Bar Association, and he he's just an expert in all stuff about Ukraine. I had him on last May well before the the invasion. And uh, and he was talking about Ukraine and Russia um, historically and how the United States basically through all kinds of governments, whether Democrat or Republican, has misread what Russia is and what Ukraine is and what the relationship is, which is basically the civilization started in Kiev with the Kiev, the Kiev and Rus. And people say, oh, R-U-S, that must be Russia. But it's not. It's Ukraine. Everything started in Ukraine. And then Russia came later. So when Russia comes in and says, we're taking Ukraine back, it's like, what? no, that's like us being like, we're taking London back. We're not taking (laughs) London back, you know? So he makes that case. But he that was on the first time we talked a lot about that. This time he has a lot to say about mistakes that the U.S. has made in policy through the years and, you know, Putin, what Putin does, what the Russians communicate, what we can learn, lessons we can draw. And he did a speech at West Point uh, a couple of weeks ago where he addressed the cadets and some generals that he knows and stuff like that. So this is a uh, uh, somebody very smart, very knowledgeable, who, uh, you know, I've learned a lot from, uh, frankly, and uh, I encourage people. To, it's also, you know, it's a good interview. Like I was editing it again, listening to it again. And I'm like, oh, yeah, this is I, I don't want to stop listening to this. So, you know, that's pretty good. That's on if it's if it's Friday, that's on today. Next week, I have Kimberly K. Hong. She um, she's a, a an academic at the University of Chicago, and she wrote a book called Spiderweb Capitalism, which is she's a really interesting person because she her first book, I can't remember the name, it has the word desire in it. She went to like Vietnam, Myanmar and, and that neck of the woods and did e- ethnographies about basically the sex workers that live there. So she was like basically she got a job as a, as a hostess in a bar where these people hang out and interviewed like hundreds and hundreds of people and put it all in this book form, trying to study it in an academic sort of way. So this new book, Spiderweb Capitalism, is kind of the same same technique where she's infiltrating and embedding herself with this group of people, except this time the group of people are like super duper rich people, which she calls, I think, uh, ultra high net worth individuals, as distinct from the high net worth individuals who are basically just the dudes that do their dirty work and make the money move more freely from place to place. Does she give tips on how I can possibly hang out with the ultra wealthy? Um, you have to buy the book for that. Alice. All right. Yeah. OK, just checking. Honestly, it seems like the ultra high wealthy are kind of a kind of a a, um, a dish, you know, not a dish. What's the word? A pill. Mm. Yeah, they're boring. They, they they all they care about. They're just, you know, paranoid and they're constantly don't want to lose the, the the amount of money that they've gained. And there, there seems to be, and that's in, this is in the book, there seems to be a lot of uh, anxiety in that world. And I don't think they... Yeah, they, and you know. then that whole concept of how no one really holds a mirror up to these folks. So, so they mm-hmm. think they're smart and funny and, and they're never challenged on anything. And yeah, it's, it's, quite a, it's quite an interesting phenomenon. I can't wait to hear that interview. Yeah. So, and she's great. She, she's a good, um, you know, a good speaker too. Like, you know, she's a professor, so she you know, talks for a great interview. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, Amanda Moore, if you don't know her name, she is the woman who infiltrated like the QAnon, like white supremacist groups for like a year and a half. 
and just pretended she was and you know and was trying to do like inside reporting on this stuff so she came on and told me her story which is pretty interesting uh that, that was really really something I, I i i don't again you know i wouldn't want to hang out with those people i wouldn't want to hang out with bill barr and durham i don't think there's any of these people that i would really have fun hanging out with you know i mean maybe maybe kimberly guilfoyle for like 10 minutes <laughs> just to be like yo i don't understand how you could possibly have been with don jr and gavin newsom like what the actual f is going on i don't understand it yeah no me neither to be honest and and that's always a really interesting stuff that the infiltration kind of stuff like our friend lauren windsor does that as well uh poses as a, a maga person and uh, gets some really interesting tidbits and interviews and information, uh, you know, particularly about governors from governors and politicians who <laughs> who will say off camera, but she's recording that they want to ban contraception and do a national abortion ban and all that stuff. So it's really, really interesting to hear that from Amanda Moore, who who did infiltrate Q. I mean, again, I'm with you not would not want to hang out. People who hang out with Q and MAGA and watch Trump rallies so that I don't have to deserve a fucking medal of freedom or something. Seriously. Because that's just, uh, like you said, just some people I would not want to hang out with. What's his name? Was it Dan Dale, the guy, the Canadian reporter who used to you know, do all the long threads about all the Trump rallies like two, two, three years ago? You know, that guy in particular, I feel like I think they moved him off the beat. I think they should have paid him hazard pay. <laughs> You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like you, you can go to Kharkiv or you can do the Trump rally. I, I'll, I'll I'll take Kharkiv. It sounds like it's safer. <laughs> Incredible that she was able to do this. I mean, when you think of people that are impervious to being uh, pandered to or conned, I mean, QAnon and MAGA people, just those are those are the tops. Like, I mean, you would never think that, you know, a QAnon or a MAGA person would allow, say, someone who claimed to be a Rothschild to just waltz into their golf club and hobnob with the former president. But that's oh, she's wait. the bag man. I'm pretty yeah. sure she's the bag man. One of them, at least. We'll have to we'll have to see what happens with her. But yeah, no, that's going to be an excellent interview. And tell us about Sandy Lewis, too. You have Sandy coming up. I have Sandy coming on. I don't want to say too much about Sandy Lewis. The less I say about him, the better. But I have to that one's going to require a little bit more work. But that that one's going to be that's worth waiting for. He's All great. Right. He's he's okay. a brilliant, brilliant person and has a lot of really interesting things to say. <laughs> and um, yeah, he's 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 been all over the place and seen a lot of things. So uh, Wall Street wise, it's a Wall Street kind of interview. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to that one, too. All right. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you coming, uh, coming on and, and talking a little bit about what you've got coming up on Prevail. Everybody needs to definitely head over to um, either your Apple feed or wherever you get your podcast. Subscribe, follow, rate love, like, a dance, whatever you do with your podcasts that you love, because these conversations are long form, they're in depth, they hit things that we don't get to see on, you know, talking head media on, on ca the cable news networks where you get, you know, you get uh, Andrew Weissman for four minutes, uh, you know, <laughs> instead of yeah. instead of 30. So thank you so much for doing these interviews, getting this information, getting these stories from these amazing people. I'm looking forward to it. Do you have any uh, uh, final thoughts on uh, some of, you know, some of the latest news? We're still waiting to see whether Judge Eileen Cannon will grant the motion for the stay, the very narrow stay on 100 documents, or if uh, she doesn't give a shit about her legacy or having her rulings overturned and, and just either ignores it or denies it and uh, has, you know, allows DOJ, which, uh, you know, their deadline is today, Thursday, as we're recording this, they're going to go to the 11th Circuit, where I actually think they'll prevail. Speaking of prevail. Speaking of prevail. I just, what I like to do sometimes is really pull back and just, we're so in the, in the weeds here that we have to pull back and just marvel at how fucking crazy all of this is. It is crazy that we have a guy who was the fucking president, who never should have been a president in the first place, that he stole these documents, that he pretty clearly, I mean, I can't imagine a reality in which he wasn't, if not selling them, at least showing them to people that he wasn't supposed to show them to. Everybody's very blasé about it. I think, I don't know if everyone's worn down or what. No, it's true though. But every once in a while, I'll tweet one of those sort of pull back and give a 30,000 yeah. foot view tweet where I'll say, hey, over here in the United States, our former president is being investigated for espionage and sedition and just leave it at that. And and those tweets, I think, uh, allow everyone to take that step back, get out of the weeds and say, holy fuck, 
That's a true statement. And then the entire apparatus of the Justice Department has ground to a halt because a flamenco dancer who has no business being in this job, who Trump put in the job on the recommendation of Marco Rubio, one of the vilest traitors that we have in that entire Capitol Hill, suggested her because she doesn't know what the fucking lies. It's it's insane. It's insane. It's just insane. That's what I have to say. Who are you talking about? Cannon. Oh, Eileen Cannon. OK, yeah. I thought, oh, you said over at the DOJ. The DOJ, as I understand it, is not doing it. It has to stop its investigation because she yes. said so. And and the, the the intelligence community has had to stop their risk assessment to national security because, as they explained to DOJ and their filing, the the criminal investigation and the risk assessment are inextricably linked. You can't have one continue and stop the other. See, now, if I was if I was in charge, I would just be like, OK, we'll stop the criminal side and keep up the risk side, knowing that she doesn't know what she's talking about. And, you know, whatever. What it, it's like. They're, yeah, but then 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 you'll get an appeal and, and possibly an overturned conviction. Oh, please. If you overturn the conviction because of that, then honestly, hey, we are the, we are. Hey, fucked dude, anywhere. look, Bill Cosby's walking around free because of a fucking technicality. The shit Bill happens, Con man. That, yeah, that isn't national security stuff, though. Bill Cosby no. didn't sell secrets to the fucking Saudis. True. I, yeah. I understand. But, you I, you know, you definitely don't want this shit overturned on a technicality. I know. Look, look, the one thing I can say about Merrick Garland, I will give him props. He's very <laughs> careful. He's meticulous and he's not going to screw stuff up. So if he thinks this is the best way to go, I think probably he knows more than I do. I'm pretty sure. So I trust his judgment, especially with this shit. Yeah. Now saying. that we've seen, you know, 40 subpoenas going out, we've seen Wyndham looking at stuff since January. We've seen an execution of a search warrant on Mar-a-Lago. It, it seems to me he is going forward, following the facts and the law without fear or favor. And and so uh, I think there's a, a little bit more uh, trust there than there was when everything was just absolutely radio silent. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think him uh, talking was good. He, he's been since he talked and spoke to everybody, I think things have, I've felt a lot more comfortable with things. So, you know, again, more talking. Would be yeah. And he says, hey, we speak through our filings and we speak yeah. through indictments. That's when we speak. I'm not going to answer your questions. And boy, if Trump had just kept his fucking mouth shut and not given the <laughs> Department of Justice an opportunity to speak to us for 38 pages and then additional supplemental filings and unsealing search warrant affidavits and, and search warrants, we wouldn't be here. It would still be radio silent. We'd still all be a little bit in the dark. So it also occurs to me that if Merrick Garland is given a chance to speak through to us through filings, he definitely does. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. I'm just saying, again, in the big picture sort of way, the same big picture sort of way where if you were just coming down from space, right, to the United States <laughs> in 2016 and you knew nothing about anything, and we said, hey, we're a democracy here in the United States and we've had a presidential election. Oh, who ran? Oh, Hillary Clinton ran against Donald Trump. Oh, who won? Well, Hillary Clinton got 2.8 million votes. Oh, so Hillary Clinton won, right? Well, no, there's a little <laughs> thing called the Electoral College. That sounds <laughs> like crazy bullshit. I mean, to, objectively, it sounds like crazy bullshit. And the ex-president stole 1,100 classified documents and we can't find some of them in the South. And it, there's foreign nationals crawling all over the place where they were. We have to wait, though, because of a technical. That also sounds like the person from space would be like, are you are you high? Like, what's going on? Like, I yeah. get it. Although, yeah, it's but it's, it's also it's, in the big picture. It's it's just and this is what I mean. It's nuts. Well, I've, yeah, I've lost my. Yeah, we always have to walk this line where, you know, if the shoe were on the other foot and you're actually protecting an actual innocent person, they have to have all of these sort of reprieves as they should. But it, it definitely can backfire. You can you can have somebody like Trump who will just use that system to delay and delay and delay. And if there's a Republican elected in 2024, if they steal the election in 2024, everyone and everything that Merrick Garland has done and will will be doing will just be pardoned. So it's you know, yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty bananas. I'm with you. Yeah. So I tend to try to put the shoe on the other foot, though. And, and that's a good way. To, that's honestly, that's a good way to look at it. I mean, it yeah. is. So, but, you know, this, uh, <laughs> I don't even know anymore. Yeah. I it's know. just so crazy. It's so crazy. I, know. Um, I was we... listening to Les Mis, you know, this morning, because sometimes I listen to Les Mis and it's like Javert is going to get Valjean. And it's like, I don't feel like there's a Javert. I don't feel like this, there's any connection here. 
the, the criminal is actually really bad and the cop isn't isn't like, you know, die hard enough. That's how I feel. I'm like that. That's Les Mis in the Trump years. It's just Les Maga or something. I don't know. Yeah, we need like a last Boy Scout kind of a, a thing to to for it to be as effective as I want it to be. I want it to be the end of The Godfather. I want it to be the baptism scene, but with indictments where like, <laughs> you know, uh, there, there's like like Biden is at the State of the Union address or something and they just roll the fuck out and arrest everybody while no one's paying attention. That's what I want. That's what I want. If I have that, I, I can't even that would make up for all of it. Now, that now we're in justice porn territory where we are. You know, we we are. Just, that, isn't that I mean, you know, list we're, our we're, fantasies. I'm, however many you know minutes into the interview, we're allowed to, you know, uh, is justice porn different than hope porn? I don't know. What's yeah, the... uh, I think so. Yeah. Well, you know, if you hope for justice, then they're probably the same thing. OK. But and I've been accused of of, of both. So. I recall. I, re- I recall. <laughs> I, I want to uh, say that's ridiculous. I think you do a great job of, of keeping everybody honest and presenting everything. Thank you. And we found out that Mark Meadows did get subpoenaed by the Department of Justice and complied. And I was like, I told you. They did, you know, everyone's like, oh, I just didn't indict Meadows for contempt. He's just walking away. They're not going to investigate him. I'm like, come on, bro. That can't even be real. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. We'll see. I mean, you know, we'll see how far it goes. But another thing that's crazy, the Mark Meadows thing, like he he registered to vote in some shack. In upstate <laughs> New- like it. What the f- like? West Virginia, think, right? I think. Did he think no one would ca- find out? I mean, mm-hmm. I know he's really dumb. I mean, I think my sense is that he's really dumb. And you heard the story about how he got the job, right? That Hugo Lowe told on my podcast. He, he yeah. basically was floating it around and then they just hired him. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Because yep. nobody else would take the job. Hey, what's the deal with this trusty guy? I mean, at this point. Oh, my right, God. We're so at the end of the line. Like, I feel like it, it's like you know, like a like a TV show that's in this 80th season and is desperate for new people. And they're like, I guess this lawyer. I mean, he <laughs> just seems. Yeah. And, and he's from a white shoe law firm. And yesterday, you know, I talked to uh, David Enrich, who just had his who, whose book just came Jones out. Jones Day book. Yeah. About these. Yeah. About these law firms. Yeah. It's it's <laughs> Jones Day. And what was that meager and flom? What was that other one that always seemed to sprout somebody who might pop up and defend a Trump or somebody in MAGA land. It's just, it's absolutely bananas. And I'm, I'm waiting for Sidney Powell to be indicted. They've been investigating her for a year now. I don't understand where the charges are uh, unless he's going to roll them all out at once or unless he considers Sidney Powell somehow political and, and won't do it during the 60 day blackout period. Who knows? Again, they're, they're still the DOJ. They still don't tell us what's going on until indictments or filings happen. We'll see what happens with that. But uh, I appreciate your time today. We've gone over time. That's okay. I don't think people will mind, but I appreciate it. Everybody, again, check out Prevail. And um, we'll talk soon again, my friend. Thanks for having me. Great to be see you. Everybody stick around. We'll be right back with the good news. Hey, I'm Ben Micellis. I'm Brett Micellis. And I'm Jordy. And we are the hosts of the Midas Touch podcast, the top rated, top watched political podcast for pro-democracy content. Each week we do multiple episodes where we break down the political issues of the day here in the United States and abroad as we fight for democracy. Isn't that right, Brett? That's right, Ben. We've had conversations with some incredible guests like White House Chief of Staff Ron Klain, Beto O'Rourke, DNC Chair Jamie Harrison, Glenn Kirshner, Mary Trump, celebrities like Deborah Messing, Alyssa Milano, Michael Rappaport, and more. So subscribe to the Midas Touch podcast wherever you get your podcast. That's the Midas Touch, M-E-I-D-A-S-T-O-U-C-H podcast. Jordy, anything to add? Shout out to the Midas Mighty. Everybody, welcome back. It's time for the good news. Who likes good news, everyone? Then good news, everyone. Good news, good news. And if you have any good news, confessions, corrections, uh, you want to play What the Mutt, where you send in a photo of your rescue pup, and we badly try to guess what breeds comprise within your rescue pup. Or you can send us photos of adoptable pets in your area. Uh, whatever you want to send to us, any good news we'll take. You can do it by going to dailybeanspod.com and click on contact. And first up, from anonymous pronouns, he and him. Hi, my youngest child came to live with us last year. I could not be happier to have them here. When they moved in, they brought their adorable cat. It's taken 10 months for Shadow, the cat, to warm up to Ella, the dog. 
It helps that Ella stopped licking her chops every time Shadow is close. (laughs) Ella so desperately wants to play, but she is very patient. I keep hoping to come home to find them snuggled up together enjoying a nap. Along with these two furry friends, I'm including pictures of my other kid's cat, Ruxpin. Oh, isn't it Teddy Ruxpin? Cool. He enjoys lounging and leaving ball prints on the glass coffee table. (laughs) Thanks for giving me a smile and a laugh every morning. Listen, listen, I love these hairless cats. These sphinx, I think that's what they're called. Yes. Oh, some people think they're ugly and I think they're the cutest damn things on the planet and they feel like suede when you pet them. They're so cute. They're very uh, grippy. <laughs> look at the wrinkles. Look at the dog. <laughs> oh shit, what is that? <laughs> what a cute pupper and this beautiful floof of a kitty. And Ruxpin. Thank you for that so much, Anonymous. All right. Next up from Kiarsa, we've got pronouns she and her. Good news. I may have done the most lesbian thing ever. A very cute girl is moving from Ohio to be with me, her in Oregon, at least until our move to the Boston area to be closer to another one of my partners. I'm a little anxious about housing at the moment, but I'm still very excited about all of this. I attached a pic for what the mutt. He follows me home from the park. Oh my God. I was hoping you could help me with the breeds since you all are great at that. Um, that would be a snake. This is a snake. This is a this is a danger noodle. Yeah, that, uh, that's a snake. Um, I don't believe I know how to guess the. I don't know if snake. this is a joke or if the wrong pics are attached, but I have a feeling <laughs> he followed me home from the park and was hoping you could help me with the breeds, since you all are great at that. I can't imagine the snake uh, pictures in the right place. <laughs> Well, there's definitely some chow chow in there. <laughs> oh my God. Well, I'm sure in its stomach because that snake probably <laughs> ate a chow chow. Look at the snack. <laughs> oh, if this is your snack, it's beautiful. Thank oh my you God. for your danger noodle. Next up from Dale, pronouns he and him. Just a quick request to stand by the tagline vote blue over Q, even if you update it. It was never in opposition to the numbers too big to manipulate concept, unless you count brevity concerns, regardless of its rhyme. It implies an important nuance that I always preferred instead of blue no matter who without giving too much away to both sides nihilism. For pet tax, enjoy Doodlebug's leap into action and Darla's head shake when called to pose. And just to to tease this, we have a surprise for you on the sign off. So Dale, listen up. Mm -hmm. And the other submitter, listen up. We got you covered. Yep, we got it all covered. We figured it out. Look at these babies. Oh, so cute. I love the emotion shaking pictures. Is that a is that a multi poo? Looks like I, a multi poo. They both look like it, actually. This is just so fucking adorable. Thank so you for that. Cute. Oh my God. This next one's from Anonymous. Pronoun she and her. I just recently discovered your podcast and appreciate all the hard work you put in to make all this legal drama make sense. The Daily Beans is also a favorite of my dog Mimi. I listen to it on my smart speaker, and every time she hears that ding. At the very start, she runs around the house barking. (laughs) It's safe to say it's one of the most exciting parts of her day. Thanks for what you do and giving Mimi a chance to get her daily barking in. (laughs) Attached her some photos, one of her and my recently passed pup, Albie, dressed up for the in-dog inauguration. Oh my God. One of her doing her favorite activity, chasing squirrels, and a laser one of her dressed up and being naughty. Mimi's 70% beagle, 30% dachshund. Albie was a cockapoo. And the best boy ever lived to be 17 and a half. <gasps> 17 and a half. Look at this little beagle mix. Oh, look oh. at the cockapoo. Oh, you know, my, I had a dog. It was a, it was a soft-coated Wheaton Terrier named the Amazing Mumford. He used to chase the squirrels up trees. He'd get about three feet up, realize he couldn't climb trees, and then fall down. Oh, my God. I do the oh same my- thing, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> look at the... <laughs> Look at the inauguration picture. I know, oh. so cute. And the dress, okay, on this beagle dachshund. Oh my god. Oh my gosh. Amazing. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. Okay, this next dog. Okay. The cuteness is weirding me out. From Tiffany, pronoun she and her. Hi AG and DG. You are out the absolute best, brilliant and hilarious. Well, thank you. I have a correction. <laughs> you're, br- you're brilliant and hilarious, but you were wrong this one time. <laughs> this week you referred to a gaggle of chads. And I believe the collective noun for chads is a scrotum, a scrotum of chads. <laughs> oh, my God, Tiffany. Thank you for that. Love the show. Been listening for years. It gives me such hope. Love all the legal nerds speak. It gives me life. Pet tax is my little nugget, Daisy Lucille, Daisy Lou on occasion, who turned one last week. She's nine pounds of high level security. 
who doesn't let their neighbors get away with anything. Feel free to guess her breeds, but you may be surprised by one or two. Oh, and then they, they already gave us the breed. Producers, you're supposed to put these at the end of the picture. She's even parts Chihuahua, Shih Tzu, and Yorkie. I hope you like and Thanks for continuing the fight. Oh my <laughs> God, that face. Look at this little baby. Oh, so adorable. And the fur. Oh, it looks so soft. I want to pet. I want to pet too. Thank you for all the good news. Oh my God. A scrotum of Chad's is my new favorite thing. <laughs> and all these dogs and kitties and a danger noodle. Thank you for these pet photos, everyone. Seriously. Thank you so much. And uh, one more time, Dana, give us the uh, the deets about uh, Salt Lake City in November. Absolutely. If you're listening to this and you're in the Salt Lake City area or anywhere in Utah, or the surrounding areas, I am doing a show. I'll be emceeing a night of comedy and music for Utah Pride. And you can get tickets at utahpridecenter.org. I will be giving away some sets of tickets. So keep listening for that contest. And uh, I just hope you go anyway. It's for a great organization. Yes. And the the two, the couple who ended up moving to Salt Lake City and was worried and, and then it was awesome. And the white coat, send in your information because Dana wants to give you a Yeah, I believe it's your daughter. Uh, the person who's listening usually writes in about their daughter. So please mm-hmm. definitely uh, get in touch with one of our producers because it would be my pleasure that your daughter and her partner are my guest at the show. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, the weekend. It's the weekend. I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Is this the week for, let me see, is this, yeah, we have the happy hour tonight at 4 p.m. Pacific if you're a patron. If you're not a patron, sign up. You can come join us. It's real fun. Uh, we just sit around at a Zoom call. We have cocktails and mocktails and people raise hands and I answer questions. It's really great. So again, you can be a patron at patreon.com slash Muller She Wrote. That will cover all the shows that I do except for Clean Up on All 45. That has its own patron. Anyway, we don't need to get into those details until Monday. Are you are you around? Are you traveling? No, nope, I'll be Sunday? here. No. Ooh, all right. We'll be back in your ears on Monday. Until then, everybody, please take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Take care of the planet. Take care of your mental health. Vote blue over Q. And for God's sakes, take someone with you. <laughs> I've been AG. And I've been DG. <laughs> and them's the beans. The Daily Beans is written and executive produced by Allison Gill with additional research and reporting by Dana Goldberg and Amy Carrero. Sound design and editing is by Desiree McFarlane, with art and web design by Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios. Music for The Daily Beans is written and performed by They Might Be Giants, and the show is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, please visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media.